G'day everyone, I'm here with Ryan Elson of Tribe Social Belonging. How are you, mate? Good, Craig. How are you, brother? Yeah, not too bad. So we've uh, connected through a friend, but I want you to give us a little bit of background on um, what's made you establish Tribe Social Belonging. Well, firstly, Tribe is basically a, a, a place, a group that we put together for people that feel isolated or lonely or slightly out of the community for whatever reason that may be. Either um, there's plenty of reasons. They can be new to town. They can have young kids, which can be a little isolating from time to time. Could have gone through a separation and what have you. But the reason Tribe came about um, from me was I had just some difficult times in life, as people often do. Uh, we I got separated from my um, long-term wife. Um, 17 years we were together. It was quite sudden. I wasn't really ready for it. Uh, mm -hmm. I moved out on my own and was doing the um, cooking for five thing all the time as opposed to one. So I had a lot of a fridge full of leftovers all the time. Mm -hmm. But um, trying to date at, at 41 after a long relationship, which was not fun. I didn't enjoy it. Mm -hmm. And then, unfortunately, my son, Jake, one of my kids, uh, was diagnosed with bone cancer. Mm. Uh, we, we lost him in January. We didn't win. So, But out of that whole experience in that time, I was so fortunate to have so many people around me and supporting me, always ready for a coffee or a beer or, or a chat or whatever it might have been. Now, I was um, uh, President of Chamber of Commerce at that point, and we had this, uh, we had we have an event every month called the Belvedere Business Mingle. And what it is, it's a get-together. It's just simply have a few beers, have uh, a chat, have something to eat, and, and just and more business comes out of those connections that you make there than anything else that we do. What I noticed out of that at one point in time was there was a, a percentage, a fair percentage of people coming along that had either already retired or weren't really in a job that they needed to network mm -hmm. or needed to get uh, connections to, to improve their business. So I started thinking, why do they come? And, and what occurred to me is they just wanted to belong to something. They, mm -hmm. they wanted to be part of something, and that, and that was fantastic. Like, it costs you 150 bucks a year to be in chamber, so it's not free. Yeah. But they were prepared to pay that to be a part of this. Um. Once again, I started wondering about you know how I could assist people to um, have some backup and have some contacts without it being all government run and ru ruined by bureaucracy and all the rest of it that we have mm -hmm. sometimes. Yes. And so I just started putting events together uh, at different areas. Initially, mostly pubs mm -hmm. um, for a couple of reasons. Uh, they're a good place to have people. It's pretty much churches or pubs where you can have a large amount of people. Yeah. Uh, people love to have a drink. Uh, when they're having a chat, so that made sense. Yeah. And in, in honesty, uh, having uh, if you're in a hotel, they've got their own rules for getting rid of people that are unruly, and I didn't know what sort of people we were going to get, to <laughs> yeah, be honest. Cool. And so we started doing it with that, and, and we've had my count at the moment that I've got there is about 650 people, 1,600, sorry, 1,650 people that have come along to, to tribe events, and it's changed a lot of lives. So mm. that's the basis of it. So you talk about your experience with uh, when you were going through some hard times and at some point you realised that if you didn't have that support that you probably w it would have been tougher. So it was more or less an epiphany to say, well, what if people um, don't have that support around them? What do they do? Yeah, well, that, that was it. I mean, we are humans are social creatures and we seem to be going through a point in life at the moment where we try to do everything automatically uh, or via technology mm -hmm. and it doesn't work and that's okay but we've got to recognize the fact that we we most of us appreciate human contact even introverts uh as as many of them that i meet say oh i'm not too sure about this but they're still coming because mm -hmm. like they can go anytime they want like we don't yeah. lock doors behind people when they come in you can come <laughs> and go as you please but it was sort of uh there, there was a need there and it was I felt I was. Very, I'm a very lucky person. I make friends easily. Yeah. I, uh, I, I like to you know, have a party and I like to um, have a lot of people together. So for me, that wasn't hard. So mm -hmm. I was in a position where I could get a bunch of good people together, and invite those that were insecure, anxious, um, isolated, lonely, fringe dwelling for whatever reason, and most in not of their own accord, not of their own fault. Mm to be able to come along and provide a safe and, and friendly place for them to come. And you have some rules around uh, when they rock up that they can't speak to people that they actually know, we're, as well as just try and get to know other people. Exactly right. There's, there's two rules to tribe gatherings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the first one is that 
We, you, you must speak to people you don't know. We don't want people sitting in cliques and coming together. It's great that you make friends through tribe. That's awesome. Yeah. But if you're sitting there with three of your friends you've made through tribe and someone is sitting nearby that hasn't got anyone there, then you're expected to open your group up and welcome them in. And yeah. that's that's part of what we do. Everyone understands that when we get there. Yeah. The tribe name, uh, who came up with the tribe name and, and also looking at your logo, you might want to flash that to the camera there, yeah. Try Lobo. Just a bit of explanation around around the tribe social belonging, um, and where where that actual decision to make that the name of the group came out. Well, we're all sort of from a tribe, and I, I, um, I use social media a lot. I don't use it as my life. I use it as a um, I don't know, soapbox maybe, or a um, a way of communication. And I sit here thinking, well, right, what what would be a good name for this? It's all inclusive, and that makes people feel like they're a part of something. And um, I thought tribe would be a good idea social belonging this is maslow's hierarchy of needs uh which basically is a, a psychological study uh, done by a guy named maslow mm -hmm. who uh, it's it's the hierarchy of what people require in their lives like the bottom one for instance is um is food uh shelter and sex strangely mm -hmm. enough mm -hmm. uh and the second one is slightly up from that so having some more uh, comforts in their yep. lives and the middle one is belonging because mm -hmm. humans have a need to belong to something. Yeah, sure. So the triangle is part of that. There's other parts, like you become quite philosoph philosophical, sorry, at the top of it, because you've you've got everything you need. Yeah, if you're in sure. if you're in Syria currently, you're not too worried about, you know, you know thinking about what sort of a best person you can be. You're trying mm. to figure out where you're going to stay the night. Yeah, sure. So that's where that came from. But, um, yeah, the tribe we thought up, uh, Maslow's hierarchy, I sort of looked through some bits and pieces that supported that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I did put out on, like I was saying about social media, I put out on Facebook and says, what, is, what does tribe mean to you? Um, mostly people felt the same way that I did. It mm. means being a part of something. And that's exactly what we're after. Yeah. I thought about that there was a group called Our Village. They were quite, they were great um, not-for-profit. And I was thinking about that at one point in time because as we discussed previously, like it takes a village to raise a kid and that was important to me. But it felt like it needed to be more than that. It needed to be more mm. solid than that. So tribe suits. Yeah, that's pretty good. Now, you mentioned Syria there, which is sound, sounds a bit off topic, but the adversity that, that those people face and you talk about um, tribe, like when people face adversity in their lives, um, they can take two paths. So that one path might be that they can be victims. The other path might be that they can be victors. Do you want to speak to that a little bit and how the negative experience can be twisted into a positive? Well, look, absolutely. And the only thing you can control in life, Craig, is yourself. That's all you've got. There's nothing else. And it's how you react to certain situations. Now, every, every person's situation is relative to them. I get that. There are some people that become very upset and, and broken-hearted about things that wouldn't worry me in the slightest um as you know i was a cop for 10 years so you see a mm -hmm. lot of things and you, you sort of figure out that you know what's worth worrying about and what's not in saying that i've messed that up a few times and I'd, i'm happy to talk about that at some point in time and that's the thing you can you can look at everything that happens to you and you basically have to make a decision on how you're going to deal with that now are you going to let it destroy you are you going to carry that that weight around with you for the rest of your life and let it weigh you down and slow you down uh or are you going to use that as a springboard? And and I like so many things in my time. You have the from the darkest times. Not only come the best songs you might notice, <laughs> yeah. but come some of the best things in life if you can use that that power to do something with that. Because that's what it is. Like grief and disappointment and and you know all those feelings there. They they are a sense of power. They are there's something in those. And if you can guide them towards something good. And make something good happen out of it. Well, that's that's a good outcome. Like you know, making excuses and and being in denial or, or hating someone or something, it doesn't fix anything. It doesn't mm -hmm. make anything better. Like you know, and people just need to look at things differently. And if you can establish that in people, well, you're going to get on a better track than what you could if you just sit there in your misery all the time. Mm. So some people are fortunate enough to not have too many significant adverse life changing events. But you've had across your life several different experiences that have you've always managed to uh, navigate or twist into positives. Um, do you want to speak to some of your experiences that have sort of uh, helped make you the person you are today and made you arrive at this decision to establish Tribe? Yeah, as I said to you earlier, it's, um, it can sound like a bit of a bad country song. It's not. It's just one of those things. But um, yeah, look, as a as a young fella. Um, 
it was a little difficult. My uh, mum kicked my dad out when I was seven. Uh, he'd been giving us a fair hiding for a fair while, my brother, myself and my mum. And uh, every all the money he hadn't been gambling away, he'd been drinking. Mm-hmm. She told him he had to go, that that was it. Uh, she loved him very much, though, and she said, uh, when you fix yourself up, you can come back. So she made no efforts, to my recollection anyway, to date anyone or, mm-hmm. or move on or do anything. Mm-hmm. She was waiting for him. So she was living in hope that he'd come back a changed man, that that was enough for him to be a life-changing That thing. That was my understanding of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, unfortunately, she died two years later, mm. uh, and so I don't. That's my understanding, yeah. as far as I recall. Um, yeah, she got killed in a car accident. Um, when I was nine, and my brother and I then went to Guardians. Um, unfortunately, Guardians weren't quite ready for it. When you sign that little piece of paper to say, oh, yeah, we'll look after the kids, just, just have a think about it mm. first and figure out if it's really what you want to do. Uh, I remember sitting there as a, a 10-year-old with my Guardian and my grandmother arguing about who had to have me, not who wanted mm-hmm. to have me, and which was something that sort of sticks out a little bit in my yeah. time. As a, as a child, you'd be trying to interpret that interpret that and that would bring up some emotions around your worth i'd imagine well you just want to be loved when you're a kid Mm. like you want to be wanted and but it comes back to belonging again it's you want to be part of something and feel like you're part of something yeah and and that's that's it you want to be part of something that and people that care for you and like every time tribes on just as a slight aside like i hug everyone all the time Mm -hmm. like i'm a hugger I tell people I care about them. I tell all the people I love that I love them because it's bloody worth it. Yeah. Like, you know, it means something to somebody. Yeah. So anyway, I had that going on. And, and anyway, I, I flicked back and forth from my, uh, my guardians and my grandmother. Um, never worked very well, to mm-hmm. be honest. Mm-hmm. And I was probably a handful too. Like, I mean, I, I can't, I, I'm sure I was. Um, I've always been a bit of a clown and messed around, so I'm not yeah. pretending that I was ever perfect. But then when um, primary school finished, I went to boarding school, which is a bit of a bit funny because it was five k's away from from where we lived. So everyone else was travelling three hundred k's or whatever to yeah. to go home, and I'm you know I could be there, I could walk there. Yeah. So and yet you felt that was also part of a decision to more or less say, well, let someone else deal with him in that situation. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's like a big childcare centre. Yeah. I mean, that's what it was like. It was especially you if you're there. five kilometres away. It's sort of like, well, why am I here when yeah. I can walk to school? Yeah, it was ridiculous. Like, and but that was how what they wanted out of their time. And and may I say too, as scared and and um, against it as I would, it was, it was it was one of the best things that ever happened to mm-hmm. me. I mm-hmm. always had twenty mates to mess around with. Yeah. We, we ruled the school to a large degree. Netball training was a great perv every time. <laughs> every time it was on, and and I always had once you're a boarder, you've always got a bunch of brothers yeah, that, yeah. that look after you. So. Mm. I'm grateful they did it. Just yeah. why they did it didn't thrill me. Yeah. So you also had mentors around you growing up that you feel steered you in the correct way and believed in you. How important was others believing in you um, to help you follow the path to become a cop, which was one of the things that a lot of people probably wouldn't, and including yourself, A, hadn't thought about, let alone um, thought were possible at the time? No, nah, look, this might take a little while, but I'll give you the rundown on it. Like, I, I was provided with amazing opportunities by people that didn't have to give them. And mm-hmm. that's important. And, and Tribe's a lot of that. Like, yeah. you know, Tribe is opportunity when you think about it. Like, mm-hmm. it's the opportunity to come along, get out of your cave, um, meet people, uh, establish friendships, whatever, whatever relationship you want. There's been a few couples come out of Tribe, which is not de- the intention yes, necessarily, sure. but it's part of it. And, and there's been jobs come out of it. But, yeah, just at that level, like, I, I was in year 10, uh, I hadn't been doing well at school because I didn't care. Uh, I love mess- messing around more than I love doing doing any schoolwork. Mm-hmm. Uh, my guardian sat me down and said, uh, you're wasting our money. Uh, we are not putting you into year 11. You're only going to be a labourer anyway. So just uh, we'll knock off in year 10 and you just go do your thing and you move out. And I just said, okay, because that's, that's what you expect. It's what you're told. Yeah. So that's what you run on. I was very fortunate to have um, two, a, a, a friend of mine's parents um, who are still, they're called my foster parents now. Uh, they're not officially, but what else do you call mm-hmm. them? And they were amazing. I used to go to their place with my friend um, and they, they would have discussions and disagreements without punching each other in the head. Yeah. They would have disagreements that they discussed mm-hmm. and it wasn't a screaming match and mm-hmm. everyone got a say and I, yeah. it just blew my mind. Mm-hmm. But anyway, they, I was at their place again and they said, oh, Ryan, what, do you, what subjects can you do in year 11? And I said, I'm not, I'm going to be a labourer. And they just dropped their jaws and they said, why? 
I said, oh, that's what my guardian said that I'm going to be. So that's it. They obviously decided, no, that's not going to happen. Uh, I'm not sure what happened after that, but they did go and backdoor my guardians and go and see the school. Mm -hmm. And I had chats at school. And from what I gather, uh, it was basically decided that, no, this is wrong and we're going to do something about this. Mm -hmm. So I was invited to come to year 11, uh, much to my guardian's disgust. Uh, I had one of the provisos was though, that I had to do a level three course. Mm -hmm. Now, level three was the highest course back when I was there. Uh, I'd only ever done level twos because I could mm. do no work yeah. and sort of go okay on them. And I did biology. Uh, I picked biology because cutting up frogs and stuff's pretty cool. So <laughs> I thought I'd have a crack at that. I was, once again, I was very fortunate to find an external person who cared about me that didn't have to. Mm -hmm. Mrs. McDonald was my uh, biology teacher, this funky little pommy chick mm -hmm. who cared. Yeah. Um, I got into biology and I was trying. I wanted this. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. One of the important parts about this story is that you are presented with opportunities, but as a person, you have to take opportunities. Yeah, like sure. A lot of people get presented with opportunities and do nothing, mm -hmm. and nothing changes. And for whatever reason, I was given the opportunity to go to year 11, and I, I wanted it. Like yeah. I took it. There's a saying that I've referred to, and I think I heard it first on one of Darren Brown. I don't know if you know the hypnotist Darren Brown. Mm. But I, I saw it on his show, um, and it's about luck and, and opportunity. And he basically come up with the equation, which makes sense, is that luck is actually where preparation meets opportunity mm -hmm. and that technically says there is no such a thing as luck we make our own luck by being prepared and recognizing an opportunity when it is presented to us so i couldn't agree more yeah i mean and, and i often look back and i'm grateful for these people but i, I won't lie i'm grateful to me for having a crack mm -hmm. like just thank god young fella i'm glad you had a go so so do you think you recognized opportunity then do you think that that you're you recognize that Opportunities, actually, this is my opinion, is preparation's the work you do, but opportunity is often, um, and they say it's not what you know, who you know, but Life it is, is who you know. Yeah, yeah, it's it, yeah, it's it, exactly. So tribe will present opportunities to people, mm -hmm. like you said. They, some people are in relationships now. Now, had they have never stepped out of their front door, and that's part of the reason why tribe social belonging exists, they wouldn't have found a person, whether they were looking for that or not. The point being is they. The preparation is in making the decision, I'm going out tonight, I'm going to go to this place. Mm -hmm. The opportunity is that they've met someone and, and it's through the opportunity of you saying, we're having this event. Yep. I, I quite often refer to tribe as like the gym. Mm -hmm. Like You can sit and look in the window if you want, or you can, you can even join a membership. But if you don't turn up and lift, nothing's changing. Yeah, sure. Like, and you've got to do that. And that's, that's taking an opportunity. And... Anyway, Mrs. just going back to Mrs. McDonald, because I just want to acknowledge these people. I, um, Mrs. Mac, I was trying, mm -hmm. and I was failing bad. Like, yeah. term one came along, and I was going down. Mm -hmm. um, I, was, I started getting good at throwing furniture again yeah. and throwing books and having a tent. And, and, and she came over to me after class one day, and she said, you don't know how to study, do you? And I said, no, I've never done this. I don't know what I'm doing. So this teacher came home to my house on a Saturday and spent four hours of her time teaching me how to study. Mm -hmm. uh, I still use different pens all the time when I'm teaching. Uh, I do a lot of job seeker training and all that stuff. And, and I use all different colours because that's what Mrs. Mack told me to do. Mm -hmm. And I use different highlights of things because that's what she told me to do. And she spent the time to do that. In addition, there were so many other things she did during that year to teach me how to be somewhat of a scholar. Not that I'm particularly mm. a scholar, but how to learn. Um, and I passed. I passed bio in that year. I didn't I didn't credit or anything, let's not pretend, but I passed. That gave me an opportunity to go to year twelve and I tried four level threes then so as to matriculate. I got mm -hmm. three. Um, I'm still not sure what social psych means. To be honest, <laughs> okay. I don't know what happened there, but but she gave me that chance. Yeah. And then just the last one I'll talk about now, because there's been so many, but the yeah. last one I'll talk about now is a guy called Bob Fielding, who's no longer with us, unfortunately. But I was at his place with another friend of mine, Amanda. And he said, after we'd finished school, this was November, he said, Rhino, what are you going to do for the rest of your life? Because I was teasing him up and being a jerk as usual and just having fun with him. Yeah. And he said, I don't know, mate. And he said, well, why don't you join the cops? And we all had a bit of a laugh because I'd been done for setting fire to bins and stealing and fighting and, mm. you know, usual little... You juvenile. Yeah, juvenile stuff, idiot sort yeah, of stuff. stuff. And, um, but he was a superintendent of police. Mm -hmm. And he said, do it. Go and do it. You'd be good. 
and I put in my application and I had to do all the tests myself and I had to do all the physicals myself yeah. and I had to do all the bits and pieces myself. But that was November and I was sworn in in April. Yeah. And what, what all that is about, all those things there, for me, any time you can sit down and lie down and say this is too hard or it's not my fault or it's not fair or this sucks, you can do that any time you like. But you can also fight on. Mm-hmm. Now, I never made a conscious decision as a kid. I do as an adult all the time. Yeah. But as a kid, I never made a conscious decision to, to do that. I just think I wanted better. I yeah. wanted something better and it was presented to me. So all these people gave me this opportunity to be better. Mm-hmm. I was decent, good enough to take that opportunity and do something with it. And what I want to do through Tribe and Employ Meet, which we'll talk about soon, yeah. and yeah. Tribe Youth, which we're hoping to kick off shortly, sure. is provide those opportunities through myself and through other like-minded members of the community. Mm. So um, what did your stint as a police officer actually teach you? Because you would have been dealing with a whole range of issues. Some you would have seen from the inside too, domestic violence, alcoholism, Mm -hmm. those sorts of things. Um, What does that teach you about the human experience from now you're in a situation where you're required to not only enforce the law, you have to have a degree of um, humanity about you, which some cops get a bad rap. Because, oh, you, you can lose it easily, and I'll, I'll, I'm happy to talk to you about that yeah, if you like. Sure. But I, you learn a lot of different things in regards to the things that you attend. Um, nothing becomes really shocking after a while, mm-hmm. uh, which is so you're becoming desensitised to what you're seeing as you yeah. see it more. Yeah, and you get used to misery. Like you, you consider mm. this, right? Everyone calls a cop on the worst day of their life. Yeah. Like I don't know how many times you call the police, but it wouldn't be many. No. And it's always when you're out of control and you can't do anything else. Mm-hmm. And as a copper, you turn up to that six, eight times a shift. Yeah. Now, that's hard going sometimes. Mm-hmm. And with- How does that affect your psyche, A, in a job where you'll know the next day? You don't know what the next day will bring. You might be able to assume some things, but you're probably, in the scheme of things, you, you're seeing a spectrum of, of the worst. Yeah. Um, it could affect you in a few different ways. You become, you can just not care mm-hmm. and, and not worry about that, and you lose your humanity out of that. And do some, you think you saw that in the job with with some individuals? Do you oh, think... coppers, yeah, huge, yeah, absolutely. And that's how they get by, and they don't give a shit, and they hate mm-hmm. everyone. And and that's apart from they generally don't hate other cops. And yeah. I am generalising entirely, but it's yeah, of it's, course. it's what I have seen and what can occur. Is it? it it's almost a tribe within itself. Oh, the, the brotherhood. It's a brotherhood. Mate, I, I've referred to it like the same as the bikies. Mm. Like we wear uniforms. We've got a code of conduct amongst ourselves. You look after you, each other, you know, as mm. as much as mm. you can. So it, it's a very similar thing in that sort of sense of tribe, sort of sense of belonging. It's, it's not how you necessarily go in, though. It's a, no. something that's a culture and also something that, like you say, can change over time. Um, Based on your experience, and is that a, that's another decision? Then is it's coping mechanism, I guess. Mm-hmm. How you, how you deal with it? Yeah, exactly. And I mean, it's it's an interesting thing. Like if you look at it, it probably bears upon tribe a bit as well. In that, I I came out of a situation with my border, my border friends, and, and where we were brothers, and we looked after each other, and I loved that, mm-hmm. and that made me feel for the first time ever really like I was part of something that was strong and, and important. The cops was a very similar thing. Um, and it is a good institution. Most, like, all coppers go in for the right reason, mm-hmm, I would say that. Mm-hmm. Uh, some can get twisted because of whatever reason and some can uh, get too involved in the in the culture, you know, you're either with me or against me mm-hmm, sort of thing, which mm-hmm. can be a difficult thing. But, you know, I, I, when I left after 10 years, like I was 20, 29 at that point mm-hmm. in time, I'm a, I was a very different person than what I am now. And you do look at life differently. It took me a couple of years, I think, probably to re-establish that not all the community thought like I did yeah. um, about certain things and punishment and the way people should be dealt with. Mm. And I, I'm an entirely different human now than I, I was then. I guess it's an indoctrination into a system as a cop, basically, because it is basically enforcing laws that you didn't write and don't necessarily agree with and Often, you just say yeah. that's that's what it says so that's what we do yep and, and, and does that take a degree of humanity away from those decisions oh, i guess absolutely and i guess it has to because of the nature of enforcement it is actually enforcing mm-hmm. the law so they don't necessarily want you to be making those 
decisions um, based on that you're dealing with a person necessarily, you're dealing with an act. Oh, yeah, 100%. I mean, a lot of the stuff you do, you don't agree with. Mm. And because you have to, though. But it's your mm. job, and that's what you're sworn to do. And it's more than a job. To be a military, anything that's force-based would have that same degree of um, requirement that you are fulfilling government policy at the end of the day, because that's what it is. An extent, the law is an extension of of what government has implemented to say this is how society will operate. But military, I imagine, would be the same scenario. That, that yep. It's they... exactly the same. Like, I've often referred to it as... Like, in the police, you are a tool. Mm-hmm. Like you are part of an arsenal, if you like, or whatever it might be. And wherever you're required, you will be put there. Mm-hmm. I and mean, we used to get forced transfers um, often um, mm-hmm. that you go to a certain place because they had to have someone, and yeah. that's it. And in the military, you, you don't often get... You might get a small um, window of opportunity to go where you want to go, but generally you'll go where they need you. Yeah. And, and that's how it works. And and that's fine, but I mean, going back to the, the question, I don't want to see you running down coppers. I've been out for a fair while now, but it's <laughs> it's... Yeah, it, it's not running them down. It's probably talking to giving voice, having been in the force, mm-hmm. to talk about life outside the force and what perspective you gain or glean from being in that environment to now being outside of that environment. And you said it took you a while to to come back to a situation where you were joining the mainstream, so to speak, from a different perspective and looking at different perspectives. Yeah. I, I would, yeah, I'd say you're pretty right on that. I mean, coming back to being a caring person, a really deeply caring person again, because in the cops you can't. Mm-hmm. Like you can't associate yourself with every stray or waif that you come across because it would just weigh you down. Mm-hmm. And and it's funny, like my, my awesome Mrs. Emma and I joke all the time about taking strays and waifs in because we've got them all at our house half the time, mm-hmm. these different people that we love dearly. But it's, you know, you, I can do that now. To a degree, and I love doing that. And that's tribe is about, you know, the opposite of all of that, and it's about acceptance and loving people and and what have you. But yeah, I mean, the cops taught me a lot of different things about belonging and togetherness. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I found it very difficult, like a lot of coppers and military guys do, when I got out, because I had gone from a strict, um, right, you know, regime at school, if you like, where you're told what to do, what to wear, where to go, what you know, where to be. Mm. Same in the cops. Ooh, that that is exactly yeah. how it is, and you always got to cover your ass, and you've always got to watch out for yourself. And then all of a sudden, I'm let loose in Queensland because I was the Tassie copper, and I was trying to find a job. I ended up in real estate by accident. I didn't. I never dreamed of being a real estate agent. I can tell you that much. But it was, and it's a whole different world. And and you're off the leash a lot, and you got to find your own way. And I think that's why but a lot of guys get into trouble. That experience with the real estate stuff, you were identifying that that. You also saw the sometimes the worst that people have when it's driven by money. That that there's people who own multi million dollar businesses who would screw people over for three hundred bucks. Yeah, I I often joke about I, I met more crooks and con artists in five years in real estate than I did in ten years in the cops, and it's not really it's not really a funny joke. But um, yeah, it's it, it's money is a weird thing like a, a lot of most of the stuff you do as a cop in, in all honesty is not driven by money it's driven by mm. emotions and mm. you know I mean yes there's thieves and all sort of stuff there but there's quite often underlying it's, parts it's, of that it's to me law enforcement seems to be driven by safety yep it's actually a safety thing that if you allowed things to run rampant um, people get hurt mm. well the, t- the two the levels are important so first of all safety of people and then safety of property like, mm-hmm. never get the two confused mm-hmm. and yeah and getting into real estate was difficult like I, I i my mind boggles at the amount of people i've worked for that have got so much so much money so much whatever and they still want to screw a tenant or a buyer on a property for just a little bit more and mm-hmm. I, I never sort of got that i never understood like, how much is enough like yeah. i mean what do you need in your life to make you feel better and and the truth is that money and property doesn't do it you've had a couple of life-changing experiences um, one of them being separating with your first wife. Um, do you want to go into that life experience and, and what that taught you? Yeah, for sure. I I broke up with her about nine years ago initially. Mm-hmm. Um, we ended it completely about, I think it's about four years ago, but I could be wrong on that. Uh, and nine years ago, this is, and this is an interesting thing to say, I wasn't being as good a man as I could be. Mm-hmm. And I'm very fortunate, and once again, I don't know why I'm like this. I'm, I'm glad I'm like this, but I had two options. 
I could have gone down a path of hating her and blaming her and saying it was all her fault, but it wasn't, and it never is. Yeah, it just never is. There's only one person you can you can you know control, and it's you. There's nothing else. And I was sitting in a shed where I was living. And I was trying to figure it out, and I was really bereft, like I was in a bad mm, way. But, mm. And I remember thinking, don't hate, don't hate, what did you do? And I thought about it, and a friend of mine, an awesome mate of mine from the Coppers, he said to me when, we were, when I was in the midst of it, I was talking to him, and he said, Rhino, did you forget to be nice? And he's so right, I forgot to be nice. I had this beautiful person that I love so much, and I forgot to be nice to them. And I, that occurred to me that that was a fact. Mm. And the other part that I figured out, and someone may have said this, but I think I got this one on my own, is I, I just sweated the small stuff. Like, man, I got upset about nothing and mm. made, you know, changing the lounge room around a big deal. Like, yeah, who cares? Yeah. Or, yeah. or you know, doing this or doing that. And, and they, those things ruin marriages. Mm. And, I, and I did that. We got back together after a year. Um, I was a different person, and I truly mm-hmm. was, and I'm very, once again, I'll give myself a little pat on the back for looking at myself as opposed to looking at everyone else. Yeah. And we had another four years or so together, but it was it was already broken, in truth. We tried to put it together, because we did love each other, we didn't yeah. care, but I think, you know, it's hard to repair something once you've broken it. Yeah, sure. And, um, and I take responsibility for, for my part in all of that, and... And then we, we broke up. And then obviously telling you about moving out and doing all those things was another journey on that. But mm. I just think you've got to look at every every dark thing that happens yeah, and try and find a way to use it mm-hmm. and to do something better with it. And my thing in the first breakup that we had was to look at myself mm-hmm. and, and check it out and see what I could do. And I still do that every day. Yeah. But with the second breakup and then figuring out life after that and then Jake being diagnosed with his cancer, mm. it gives you another thing of, right, what am I going to do with this? Mm. Like Jake, Jake's sickness and death was the most horrific thing that's ever happened to me and ever, have, ever happened to my ex, absolutely. Mm. And But what can you do? You're stuck. You're in, this, you're in a tunnel with the train boring down on you and there's nothing you can do. And, and we went through that together and we went through that as two families. Like she has her partner... And my partner, who's mm. been amazing for me, and with, without them, a tribe wouldn't exist. It's that simple. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But you've got to figure out what you can, what good you can bring from all of this. Otherwise, you just wallow in in your misery, and mm. there's no joy in that. So, how important? Uh, you started tribe, uh, I believe it was end of last year. You lost your son at the start of this year. Yep. And how important has it been as a project to keep you focused and give yourself purpose, and and not feel that all the adversity that you've faced is in vain, that you can actually change the narrative of, of where your life is. Amazingly important. Uh, it's, uh, it's, you said something a second ago when you said it about having purpose. Now, I, I do a lot of stuff in employment as well, but one of the biggest things I talk about employment, it's not necessarily the money. Mm-hmm. Like, it's having a purpose. Like mm. if you just wander around life with no purpose, like you, it does your head in. Yep. Something to wake up to every day. Yep, a reason, mm. a reason to to be here and to do something. And and tribe has been so important on that for me. Like I I hate I'm a bit of a loose cannon. Um, I've actually got a t-shirt that displays that, that my missus bought for me. Uh, I I hate stuff that doesn't work, especially systems and and mm. and. I have a habit of attacking systems that are just useless and don't work properly. You're, we were discussing stuff out there. We're very similar in, in a lot of ways. That's one of the ones is this whole concept of status quos and being comfortable where you're at and, you know, I think driving change and being prepared to change is a huge thing that, that a lot of people miss and I think a lot of organisations miss. That's got you and I both into trouble yeah. because we have a it's and will attend, again and will again <laughs> and will again um, because we talk about organisations and having um, core values mm-hmm. and integrity was a word that we discussed earlier off camera and we might come and speak to a little bit about that but when you talk about systems and recognising um, you know faults in systems you might the problem with calling things out can make people um, look self righteous or righteous. Mm-hmm. And but it's not actually about that. It's just about asking questions. And we discussed being on boards where people disagree with you, and you've got to be prepared to have a voice. But like you said earlier, when you're talking about learning a different way from a different family, that they could sit down and have a conversation and disagree mm-hmm. without a shouting match, um, and still walk away at, like with with no animosity. 
in organizations and in systems, it seems like if you challenge the system, then those fights can put you on the outer. And they probably shouldn't. We've been, we've been taught that if you disagree with someone, um, then that's it. And, it. and it's probably more than that. It's got to be something where you learn from it and move forward. Jeez, bro. We could be here all day in here, brother. <laughs> yeah, look, I, 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 I think we, as a society, have just put up with so much that doesn't work because that's the way it's always been done. Mm -hmm. And we sit there and rave on about the word innovation all the time now, but yet we stifle it at every opportunity because oh, well, it, it wasn't like that. And and my, I have a, I have a real hatred, which I've got to learn to deal with a little bit with bureaucracy mm. uh, and just how damaging it is to to how we go as a society, how much good it stops because of mm. all these systems that are put in place that don't work and don't make any difference on that. Uh, I remember people um, years ago, I remember some people that lived near me that were practitioners in the health industry and they were saying for every one practitioner there was two pen pushers yep. um, and that the bureaucracy and the, the hoops and the things just for the practitioners to go through from a health system situation, they said that that dynamic should be flipped that it would be better served if the health system didn't have so many admin and so much bureaucracy and had more practitioners mm -hmm. and they said most of the money goes towards admin and that happens within charities too a lot of people get upset because they donate money to charity and find that the majority of the money spent on admin and not where they thought their money was going. Oh, a hundred percent. And part of, but part of the problem with that for charities is the fact that the government demands so much documentation mm. and filling out forms for you that you have to employ someone mm. to do it. You've had an experience recently trying to um, go yeah. with the government or agency. You don't want to speak too ill of that, but the, the process you can speak to the process that it that you you were saying that it's. Um, you spent 16 hours doing preparation for it, only to be told you have to pay thousands of dollars in an audit just to make sure that your organisation meets those requirements. Yeah, well, look, it's look, part of... part of look, We, have, as Tribe, have tried to avoid government money. We haven't gone mm -hmm. for any government mm -hmm. grants or anything like mm -hmm. that, because we don't want to argue with other not-for-profits. There's plenty of people doing good things, and they need that. Yeah. And I also don't love dealing with government, so therefore, mm -hmm. if I can avoid the whole thing, I will. Uh, yet we have had a lot of people with disabilities uh, want to interact with Tribe. Part of NDIS, which is what I'm going to be talking about, is uh, having people get back in the community mm -hmm. and being able to re-engage with people, not with necessarily disabilities, but with the whole community. Mm. We provide that format already. So we got told, got advised to apply for NDIS provider status. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, the forms themselves took us six hours to fill out, and that was with a friend of mine who's very smart doing it. I would have mm -hmm. probably still been there doing it. Sure. And then afterwards, we got told we had to audit. We had to be audited, which we had to pay for, and for 16 hours of auditing is four grand. Mm. And firstly, I don't know what I'm going to do for 16 hours because I haven't mm. got that much paperwork. Yeah. And secondly, how, how, is, how is that possible? And this is mm. just another... As I said, don't get me and started. And this is a charity. It's a charitable organisation, yeah, which makes it... It's it's what you're saying, that there's a lot of people trying to do good out there, but the bureaucracy can stifle that. It ruins it. Mm. And there's people trying to do bad too, and I get that, and that's why a lot of these things are in place. But mm -hmm. smacking everyone with the same stick doesn't, mm. I don't think, makes anything work. And it's... Like we are now in a position where we can't assist people with disabilities to get back in the community as much as we mm. like because mm. of bureaucracy. Once again, and it happens consistently. Yet, as I said, we could go on all day about this, but like, I, I feel that we have created a monster as a society, and I don't see why we put up with that. We forget mm. that we actually are in charge of the government, not the reverse. Mm. And we are know, their employer. Yeah, yeah, and they they People, forget that. Yeah, and, and yes. they they, don't they, want they, to for, they forget that, but that's their narrative because they want too. us. To, yeah, but they want us to forget it, so they oh, don't absolutely. remind us. Yeah, conspiracy theory, but it's not. It's it is what. Way, the way the system works and we've created this monster that we've lost control of so mm. yeah i think it stifles a lot of good in the community it's probably not talking about exactly what tribe's about and what i'm about but yeah i think i think there's part of the right well it does because it, it eats into the vision of not just your organization it re, you you would be one person going through the same experience as many others trying to make a difference oh there. there's plenty and like you think about this tribe's free okay mm. everyone comes mm. to tribe there's no fee 
all right? If you want to, you can buy a T-shirt or a badge or something like that, and maybe that'll help a little bit. There's no money in it, though. Mm -hmm. uh, I have to look for opportunities, speaking opportunities or teaching opportunities outside of Tribe or, or side by side with Tribe. Yeah, sure. So as to get some income for myself. But Do you want to, while we're on that, do you want to talk about that? Because I noticed that you do the life coaching stuff. You do the speaking stuff. Yeah, I do. Well, I, we had we sat down over a few beers and trying to figure out what the hell I was because I'm a bit of a hard unit to pin down sometimes. Mm -hmm. But we, we called me a resilience coach based on some of the stuff we've talked about earlier, and I I sort of get people to get up and get going. But I talk a lot about opportunity and taking it as we discussed earlier, mm -hmm. and and just doing that extra mile, which is which is great. But I I enjoy speaking about doing things differently. Like tribe is it, tribe is a new thing. I, we can't find one like it anywhere. Uh, but it's not innovative in in as such that we used to do this. Mm. We used to have get-togethers. We used to people used to get jobs from meeting Mr. Langdon, uh, who owns a place down the road. But you met him in the church car park or at yeah, the, sure. or the sporting car park, and your old man introduced him to someone. But we seem to have lost a bit of that. So that's sort of that's part of what we're we're trying to establish again in that area there. But you know. As soon as you hand it into government, it's more difficult. And mm. so Tribe is fully self-run, self-funded, and we're doing our best with it. But, yeah, it's a struggle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, do you want to speak about the employment side of things? You've just established an organisation. Um, tri is it Tribe Employment? Yeah, it it's, tri it's a spin-off of, of Tribe. I, I started working with a lot of job seekers, and the system's broken there again. And like These, these poor people are told to put in resume after resume after resume, for jobs that A, they don't necessarily want, mm -hmm. um, and B, that they're not going to get. Mm -hmm. They get told to all write it in the same format. And people, like I know employers, I've been Chamber of Commerce and you know, commercial agent for 16 years, you meet a lot of business owners. Yeah. And they want to employ people on personality, initiative, and enthusiasm. You can't write that. Mm -hmm. You can't do that. So we have set up uh, a, a, a sort of a, a, an event, if you like, again, called Employ Meet. What it does is the idea is come together. Uh, we'll buy, our sponsor will buy a cup of tea or coffee for you. All you got to do is walk around and talk to people. Mm -hmm. You, as an employer, you meet people that are out of work. You have a chat to them because if you like them, there's a chance you'd be good at working with them. Mm. Employers, uh, sorry, job seekers get to do the same thing. We tell them not to bring a resume. Don't bring a resume and flick it around. Be yourself. Have a talk yeah. about what your hobbies are, what you like to do. Uh, we did the first one. In June, uh, I hoped for 40 people, and I was nervous because I had no idea how it was going to go. <laughs> I don't get nervous a lot, but I was worried about that one. Yeah. And um, we got 104 people to turn up. Mm -hmm. Now, out of that came three jobs, a number of interviews, yeah. and it was just a cool thing. Mm. We did one yesterday uh, where we had 71 turn up. I changed the time. We did an afternoon one, so that mightn't be as good, to be honest. But once again, a like, couple of guys got jobs out of it and got opportunities. But... But the thing is, like we said a few minutes ago, life is who you know. Mm. And if you don't know anyone, you're buggered. Yeah. So if you come to Tribe Employ Meet or even Tribe Gathering, you meet people, you know people. I am a sole trader as far as myself, like yeah. when I'm doing my own thing. So I don't have an employee, so I can't mm. give you a job. Yeah. But I know a lot of people. And if yeah. you rock up and there's an opportunity and I see you as a good person mm -hmm. who's capable, I can't help but notice you. Mm -hmm. So when the Siebel or the Belvedere or Moncoma or whoever rings me up and says, look, we're looking for someone to do this job, mm -hmm. I'll recommend you. And yeah. someone else might as well. It's not always experience. People talk about, oh, I haven't got experience. If you're going for an entry-level job starting something brand new, they don't care about experience. They care about who you are as a person. Yeah. Turn and that a, a resume doesn't show that. The resume's a shit. Like honestly. So that's being so that's being dissatisfied with the system yeah. that we just accept. Exactly. And once again, it's I a, fight the system, yeah. It's a process of elimination straight away that it just gives someone the ability. It's almost even though they say you can't be discriminatory, like ask about race and things like that, but that's what a resume <laughs> actually is. It's it's I'll, it's a piece of paper that will help them discriminate against you, against others. I, I love this thing where people say, I they hate being judged, or B, you can't judge someone. 
we are human beings. We are judging each other every, every day. day. When I walked in and met you today, brother, you judge me, and mm. that's okay. I'm like, oh, who's this bloody biker who's guy? That's biker? A, yeah. Yeah. I get that a lot. Yeah, yeah, well, you do have a bike. You yeah. can ride. So. <laughs> it, it's a, it's the, the observation. Oh, yeah, you haven't seen all the sleeves and stuff yet. So. <laughs> You've but, been, been very behaved by keeping your jacket well, on. I have, I was a bit cold. Yeah, yeah it is a bit cool. But it's, um, and, and that's the thing, and, you, and we... You can be as uh, politically correct and nice to people as you like. That's not the world. Not everyone gets a trophy here. Mm. So I want my guys, the people that come to Tribe, to be one up on all the others. I want them to be confident and capable and know what they've got to do. I want them to understand that they're being judged and be cool with it. Who gives a shit if someone doesn't like you? Yeah. It doesn't matter. So if you if you are true to yourself and honest, and as we said, we'll talk about integrity in a second if you like, but that's what matters. It's about... If you are feeling like every day you're being the best person you can be, that's it. Yeah. And the only one that you need to be truthful about on that is you. There's going to be others that are going to you know, question motive and things like that. I, I know in previous experiences with other things that I do, that I know people think that I do this stuff or other stuff um, built around ego, mm-hmm. but I actually don't. And, and I know that. Yep. But that's all that matters. And, and I, I don't I, care what they're... I'll I tell you an interesting thing that I... I discovered, and it's I'm similar to you. I think we get to a certain age where we start to question ourselves, mm-hmm. and when we have bad experiences, and one of those things for for me is to try and understand individuals and why they would accuse you of something that you're not doing. And it was described to me it's because they don't know any difference. That's they think people think like them. Mm-hmm. So what they actually we talk about hypocrisy, I guess is the things that they accuse you of are often the things that they do themselves because they just think everyone thinks like them. And I, I paused at that when I was told that and thinking, you know what, that's right because when I look at the things those same individuals have said of me, which is untrue, I go, well, actually, that's what they do. Mm. Yeah, I get what you're saying. It's um, I sort of other people's actions are, are their responsibility and the way mm. they behave is their responsibility. Like, I mean, it was funny you said about ego. I get... I get told I'm arrogant all the time, which is, you know, I don't know. Is that confident? I'm not real sure. But anyway, so there we go. Um, the best thing I've ever been called, though, I oh, hope you like this as much as I do, is polarizing. Yes. I, I, that's, that's the best. I'm either, you can love me or hate me, mm-hmm. but rarely everyone goes, who's met me? Really, they go, Rhino who? Yeah. And that's that's having a crack. Like, that's standing up for yourself and, and saying but what you need to pol- say. Polarizing, like, this is the thing. This is where you and I are similar. Is I'm the same. I really, here's, here's what I know. I actually have a saying that, um, you think you're destroying me, you know you're actually making me. Mm-hmm. When people put obstacles up in my way, and you'd be the same, I know for a fact, they put obstacles up in your way, you don't look at it as an obstacle, you look at it as an opportunity. Yeah. You say, okay, you're saying I can't do that, but guess what? That's not going to stop me. I'll find a way, and when I do, I'll be outside the system that you've built, mm-hmm. more or less. This more, I hope this corresponds to what you're saying now. Like when I speak to my job seekers about going for jobs and doing whatever, but I say there's three answers you can get mm. when you ask a question, and they are yes, no, and maybe. And I asked them, I said, which one's the bad one? And half of them go no, mm-hmm. and half of them go maybe. And maybe's the worst one. Maybe you don't know where you are. You're sitting there in no man's land, you're not sure. So I tell them all the time to keep asking. Keep mm-hmm. asking until mm-hmm. you get a yes or a no. Mm. No is next. No is find another way. No is get around. Like you don't walk up to a wall and smash your head on it repeatedly. You find a way to get around it, under it, over mm. it, through it, whatever. And that's that's what you're talking about for me. Like I, I sit down and people love saying I can't do stuff. They love mm. telling me I can't. And, and be it government institutions, be it groups, be it people that, you know, that love to get on a, a pulpit and say whatever. I don't care. Like if it's mm. worth doing, it's just worth doing. And and I'm in a very fortunate position to have an amazing partner mm. who just says, "Get on, honey, go get them." Mm. And, and the thing is, because because others see value in it, mm. it's because you know the value of it, and others see value in it, and you know that, like for example, that employ what is it employ employ meat employ meat little so, play on words there. Yeah, but, it's cool. Yeah. yeah, employ meat for example. That's something that that is sounds like a great idea. That's different. Mm-hmm. I don't know that it's done anywhere else. Not that I'm aware of, no. No. So, the, you know, the thing being there is that you're thinking outside the box, but you're not really thinking outside the box. It's actually something that's happening, um, that happened years ago, like you identified, but we've just lost it. Yeah. And it's no, like, 
it, it's okay if we look at it and say, oh, we lost that little bit. Like everyone's evolving. Humans are evolving. I'm evolving. You're evolving. And that's, that's the way the world works. And like I, I, I get peeved when people rag on about how social media has ruined our lives and all this stuff. Mm. It certainly hasn't mine. Like I feel like I'm hanging out with my mates every day when I'm on Facebook or, or whatever it mm-hmm, might be. Mm-hmm. In addition to that, it gives me an opportunity to, to put my thoughts and feelings out to the world and see what I get back on it. It gives I me think, a chance I, to set up these events. I think the danger... We, look, I'm... Again, I, I get on social media as a marketing tool mm-hmm. and uh, as a platform and a soapbox and, and not so much... I do watch what I say on there because it can equally... It can work for you or against you, as you probably be aware. Uh, I... I I'm in a stage where I just lay it out. Yeah, you know, pretty much. I get told yeah. off sometimes, but it's I'd rather do that. But I get what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. I, interestingly, I I work within a system as well as outside of it, yeah. so I still play the system game. But uh, it's interesting. I often say um, because I'm outside of some of that system that I when I did and made the decision to set up my own organisation, um, I felt like I was unplugging from the matrix. Do you ever get that yep. feeling that yeah, you're unplugging absolutely. from the matrix and that that on the other side of that system is actually oppor- like multiple opportunities if you don't buy into the complete game that we're forced to play 100 percent, and that's i love your analogy matrix is my favorite movie so it's and it does feel like that and i, I do feel like i'm playing outside uh, of the actual game a lot of the time like i get i've been asked so many times to run for for council or, or politics and I mean, I've got tempted a few times, but I I won't do it at, the, at this mm. point in time in my life anyway because I can do more good and more change from outside of it. Because mm. as big and ugly as I am, the machine will eat you. And and that's you know we talked about cops earlier. Yeah, I genuinely think Polly's going for the right reasons. Yeah, I do too. And then they find they can't because the system doesn't. The system, allow them. the system is yeah. so big. And so for me, working outside the system, although it's not really good for your wallet, it is great yeah. for your soul. Yeah, that's a, and that's an instru- that comes down to we we'll talk about it now integrity, um, we're, we're saying things around individuals and how within organisations and the system that being true to yourself is important. But let's have you speak to integrity and how you've arrived at feeling that that's one of the most important things we need as hum- humans. Oh, it's it is the key for me. I don't think you can get anything more important to yourself than your. Your, your integrity. Integrity is all about you. And what it is for me, I've spent a lot of hours thinking about it, a lot of 3 a.m. trying to wonder out what integrity means to me. Uh, I, To me, succinctly as I can put it, it means do unto others and be true to yourself. And you just mentioned being true to yourself there. So treat other people to like you be treated and, and be true to yourself. And now I'm a, I'm a raging atheist too. And mm. people say, oh, Jesus said that. Yep, absolutely he did. He, Jesus had a lot of good stuff to say. What happened after that? Maybe different, but mm. it's that's where it sits for me. So if I treat other people like I'd like to be treated, and I know in myself that I've done the best I can do with all honesty, mm. well, I don't think you can get much better than that. My missus has um, another analogy on it. She's a Taekwondo black belt, so she mm-hmm. does a lot of philosophy and that sort of things yeah. as well. And her thoughts are if it's integrity is doing the right thing even though no one's watching. Mm. And that's pretty simple as well, and I think that's a, a great way of explaining it too. But... So many people, you, you, you can be so often in the machine, as, as we discuss in the system, you're so often forced almost to do things against your integrity so as to get a result for somebody else or, or to get paid. And, but that is, and, and you've hit the nail on the head too. Uh, a week, recently a movie was released, Challenger, and uh, it demonstrates the failings of a system where a decision was expected to be made of the launch of that because I kept putting it off and off and off and off and off to the point that there was dissent. But in the end, they they fraudulently, I guess, had to make a decision around launch. Yep. And, and then they then look at the end result. And, and that's because the system said, we've got to launch. The mm-hmm. media's waiting. There's money on the line here. Oh, and how often is stuff money? Like, man, so many bad ways we've gone as a, as a racer because of something that we made up. Mm. which is you know currency i mean yes it's necessary and all that stuff but it's bizarre and once again it's a pursuit of more like how much do you need Mm. and like i look at some people this is a bit ranty i guess but this is something that drives me insane talking about integrity but i i deal with people that are worth a lot of money through real estate dealings or through business or through whatever else it might be chamber of commerce 
and it, they donate five thousand dollars to an, an event or buy something at an auction, and everyone gives them a golf clap and stands mm. up. Man, if you're worth fifty mil, you could change worlds. You mm. can change so much. You could change in complete areas in which you live in, but they don't. And they do it because they'd rather just give a little pittance, a bit of ashtray change. And a lot of that is deductible, goods. by the way. And, and absolutely. So then really, so while they're giving, they're getting it in a, in a, in a return, basically. A- absolutely. Tax return. So. And, and, I, and I don't get that. And look, I am sitting here relying on my um, partner to, to finance me at the moment, which is could be humiliating as a person who's always been the provider for a family, but it's, it's, it's a, a ways to a means. And I'll get there and mm. I don't want to be controlled by everyone. But... This is that's a strange part of the world when if you sit there and accept that round of applause, knowing that you basically did nothing and you walk down that path with everyone sort of bowing their head to you because you have money or, or even worse inherited money, mm. that's fundamentally flawed. Like you are you lack integrity in that point of view. I'd say what, you're worth a lot of money. How about you build some housing areas that'll mm. that'll give people opportunity to to get in there and change their lives and move on because it's bloody hard to be a better person a if you don't know anyone better and b if you've got no roof over your head how it, do you do it it would be good if wealth was measured by what you did for others absolutely absolutely that would be i think that's that's the failing of of a monetary system that how much piece of paper you can build in 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 a bank or whatever and like that means something yeah, is and, actually is actually just a flawed system again, and it is. And like, and for me, and look, people can argue with me, and and that's fine. I, I love a good debate about what my thoughts are. But as I said outside, like people ask me what drives me, what drives me. Why are you doing this? Why are you taking this path? And and it's pretty simple. Like we all we all get a last breath, last conscious breath in life, whatever that may be. Mm. And I want to be able to say to myself with integrity, Jesus, Rhino, you had a crack, mate. You just did your best mm. to effort. Whatever that result is, you didn't ever back down and do it. And there's so many people taking accolades that are nowhere near their best effort. They're not doing anything. They, we, we award money or sporting prowess or mm. whatever that may mm. be. And that's or fine. Actors. Or actors. I mean, who the hell cares? Yeah. Like, it's just not important. And if they're doing something outside of themselves and, you know, Maybe someone could have a crack here and say, oh, God, you're talking yourself up. Yeah, I am doing stuff outside myself because I feel like it's important because of where mm. I've been and what and what issues I see. But what about some others step up? Like, it's not hard. With Tribe, uh, you know, people say, oh, I'd like to volunteer. All you have to do to volunteer for Tribe is turn up. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. There's nothing else. And, and, and be involved in that. And it's not mm. hard, and still yet people still don't do it. And I don't get that. I, I just find that's a, a lack of integrity. Well, I'll uh, finish up with you there. I'll definitely get you back in. I think we could have some long conversations. <laughs> I'm getting trouble. We'll catch up and we'll talk about some other projects down the track too, I think, and uh, see see how it all goes. So thanks for your time, Ryan. Appreciate Good to the chat, you. brother. Thanks very much, man. Thanks for taking time to watch this video. If you enjoyed what you saw, please give it a thumbs up. If you haven't yet subscribed, make sure you smash that subscribe button and also hit the bell button to get notified when new interviews are uploaded. Once again, thanks for joining us and hopefully we'll see you again sometime. Catch you later.